All right, good afternoon. I'm so glad to be here for another week. It's the most exciting, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Some people say Christmas, I say no, it's Mises You for sure, hands down. Um, it's so great to be back um, with people who obviously did not just fall off the coconut truck. Is that what you said, a coconut truck? And then the cackle, okay. Um, my laugh is bad enough. I'm not gonna try to imitate hers. But uh, we're gonna talk about money and what an exciting time it is to talk about uh, money, about what it is, where it came from, um, why it's essential uh, for just thriving society, um, economy. Uh, recently, um, we've had a uh, possible new commodity-backed currency, um, talking about having that uh, challenging the dominance of the dollar with the BRICS. We've also, um, we are now well into the second decade of cryptocurrency, so it's not weird and so new now, and people don't look at you if you're, if you're like you're uh, an alien when you mention it. Um, and also, uh, there's been more interest in a return to the gold standard lately. Um, we just narrowly missed having a gold standard advocate uh, on the Board of Governors when uh, Judy Shelton was, um, her nomination failed in a vote 47 to 47 to 50. Um, so, and she's uh, interested in the gold standard and she was almost approved to be on the Board of Governors at the Fed. So it got people, even outside of Austrian economic circles, talking about uh, the gold standard. What are the pros and cons of the gold standard? So, um, of course, within Austrian economic circles, we know this is an important topic, and so we're gonna talk about it on the very first day of the week of Mises U. Um, it's always been important in um, uh, Austrian economics, and we go back through um, this morning, we heard about uh, the history of the Austrian school, and um, we can look at uh, Minger, Carl Minger's book um, on the origin of money, explains that the marketplace is what brought about money, not um, some government edict that uh, said, here's what money the money is going to be, right? Um, 20 years later, after the publication of Minger's book, we had uh, Mises' first book, Theory of Money and Credit, in 1912, where he expanded on that and explained the uh, regression theorem. Um, and there have been many other uh, great advances made in theory of money um, through the years. Uh, one of my favorites, besides What Has Government Done to Our Money by Murray Rothbard, but also uh, Rothbard's The Mystery of Banking. So, um, <clears throat> Without these uh, contributions from the Austrian economist, we may still be having the state theory of money, that money is what the state says it is. Um, <clears throat> the, the currency has value just from the sovereign's decree. So um, we know that is not the case. So let's get into it. And let's say, say, start with uh, who needs money? Who needs money? Um, well, if we start with Robinson Crusoe, oh, Tate needs money. Anybody else? We all need money, right? Uh, so we start with old Robinson Crusoe. He was stranded on the island by himself. Does he need money? Well, no, because money, um, gold coins, it's not something he can eat, right? That's not something he's going to be protected from the sun uh, and the elements with gold coins. So he has no need for money. And there's really no shopping mall on the island where he's stranded by himself uh, to go spend the money. So even later in the story, when Robinson Crusoe discovers somebody else on the island, he meets his friend Friday, uh, when there's just two people on the island, there's still no need for money, right? They're, they can make exchanges of fish and berries or whatever it is that they have to trade. They can make those trades just based on subjective values. Um, <clears throat> but when we see that it's the society expands beyond more than just a few families, then the, sage is set, the stage is set for uh, the emergence of money. 
So from Carmen's excellent lecture, we learned that voluntary exchange occurs, it comes about because both parties expect to benefit, and this comes from this undeniable external fact of differences in aptitudes, differences in skills, talents, abilities, um, not just in individuals, but also in locations. Right, and so from those differences come the need for exchanges. <clears throat> and with specialization exchange through the division of labor, um, we each develop our best skill where we have comparative advantage and each re region develops its uh, best resources advantageously in exchange. And we find that we are much better off Right, we enjoy a much higher standard of living by producing a limited number of goods, and then we rely on getting what we're going to consume through exchanging with others. <clears throat> so uh, we're much better off with exchange as compared to remaining self-sufficient or producing everything that we consume. We find that when we do that, we are pr probably pretty close to starving, right? If we everything that we consume depends on our own production of it. So product, through specialization exchange, we have a higher standard of living. But if we are doing this exchange through barter of exchanging goods for goods, we find out that we're not much better off than we were under uh, self-sufficiency, relying on all our own personal production for what we consume. So barter has two basic problems. They are um, indivisibilities and indivisibilities of goods and a double coincidence of wants requirement. And as an example, I want to tell you all about something that we did this summer. We have finally done it. Um, Peter and I uh, did something we've been talking about for years. We bought a hot tub to go in our backyard, uh, back with the pool. So um, I've got a picture of it being delivered. There's the hot tub. They're getting it off the, off the truck. And I also want to show you how it's very romantic at night after dark. So, um, and for you meme machines, I have a total gift for you all. Here is my Mr. Handsome himself <laughs> in the pool. There you go. So, uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, we found out when we bought the hot tub uh, kind of hurt my feelings a little bit, how expensive hot tubs can be. Uh, they're pretty expensive, but thankfully we live in a monetary economy. Let's try to imagine buying a hot tub under conditions of barter. So um, you all may know I teach, at, I teach economics at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, and um, uh, I don't know how to put this, yes, sick on bears, I don't know how to put this humbly, but I'm very popular. Um, my classes are in high demand. Um, get us economics joke. I know that's a lame joke, but um, anyway, courtesy laugh. Uh, so my classes always fill up, and there are always long uh, waiting lists to get in. It's getting to be the point where it's uh, becoming a problem for the university, how popular I am. So um, uh, the registrar sent me, here's an actual picture the registrar took. Uh, this is students um, begging to get into my uh, class. There they are. These are students begging to get into my class. So, uh, <clears throat> so naturally, uh, when I'm bartering, and I'm bringing my economics lectures, I'm bringing a lot of value to the trading table, right? So, however, as amazing as my lectures are, that these, and as amazing as maybe these students think they are, um, my, uh, what if the hot tub is even more valuable? What if the hot tub is even twice as valuable? Surely not, but what if the hot tub is even twice as valuable as my economics lectures? Well, what would Waco Pool and Spa, the dealer in town who sells hot tubs, what are they going to do um, if their tub, hot tub is even twice, is twice as valuable as my uh, economics lectures? Could they sell me just half a hot tub? And if they could, which half would I want? 
I, I think I want the half that holds the water. I also want the part that heats the water and blows the bubbles and all that. So what can I, what can we do? So we immediately see that when goods are indivisible, when we can't divide and buying half a hot tub is really not a hot tub at all. Um, we see that indivisibility really is a big hindrance to trade. But even when goods are divisible, even when you can split up and break up them into smaller pieces, sometimes it's different. It's difficult for the two parties to find each other to make the exchange. Because in a barter, um, in, in a barter economy, we need a double coincidence of wants. Okay, that's a requirement for any trade. And by that we mean I have to have what you want and you have to have what I want at the same time and place for us to be able to make the exchange, right? So, um, uh, for example, I have my incredibly passionate um, economics lectures that I am bringing to the table. Um, if I have that, and then Jason and Claire, my new friends at Waco Pool and Spa, they have a hot tub. Right, and so I think, oh, this is great. I have my economics lectures, which apparently everybody wants, right? And they have a hot tub, but it turns out they don't want economics lectures. What if what they really want instead is a sniper-proof sloped roof? Maybe that's what they want. So, so then there's, there's not going to be an exchange. So. For the survival of my economics professor colleague friends here, I am so glad that we don't live under barter any longer. Um, imagine us trying to eke out an existence and trying to find food and shelter and clothing based on the economics lectures and exchange, what we can get in exchange for our economics lectures. But y'all, I can't believe I was able to get this, but I have an actual before and after picture of Ludwig von Mises himself um, when he went from a barter economy to a monetary economy. There he is. <laughs> so life is much better once we have money. One other problem with barter I want to mention is that because every good trades against every other good, then each good is gonna to have to be priced in terms of all these other goods. So in a barter economy with only 1,000 goods, there will be almost half a million prices. Now, I found on YouTube how to do combinations and permutations last week so I could get these numbers for you all, so you're welcome. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, just for a scale, how many are 1,000 goods? Well, have y'all been to Aldi? It's a small discount. Uh, grocery store, but even Aldi carries a, around 1,300, their website says 1,300 of the most common grocery and household items, so more than 1,000 goods, and you can see how many prices, 844,000 prices if we didn't have money. Um, Kroger, uh, kind of a closer to kind of what we think of as a typical regular size grocery store, they carry between 40 and 50,000 goods, depending on the size of the Kroger location. Um, <clears throat> And Walmart has 120,000 unique goods. It'll be over 7 million, 7 million prices. So imagine the chaos of each good being priced in the 120,000 other goods that Walmart, that Walmart carries. So uh, Mises pointed out, money becomes more necessary as uh, the division of labor expands more and more. So as we get a wider variety of goods that we are that we are exchanging, then money becomes even more necessary. So it's clear that any sort of developed economy, like we are used to living in, any sort of developed economy is gonna be impossible under direct exchange or barter. So um, <clears throat> now we are ready, we're um, ready, the stage is set then for the emergence of um, indirect exchange or a monetary economy. So under indirect exchange, you sell your good, not for the good you necessarily want, that you're going to the market that you want to con get to consume, but um, you will trade your good for some other good 
um, that you can then in turn sell for the good that you want. Okay, uh, at first this seems like, okay, aren't we just adding steps here? Isn't this making it more difficult? This is kind of clunky. I take what I want to market and I get something I don't want and then I go trade that for something that I do want. Um, <clears throat> actually, uh, it's, it's not that. It's not making it worse, it's much better. It's an incredible instrument that really allows civilization to develop so we can enjoy the benefits of division of labor. Um, and comparative advantage that Carmen told us about. So um, <clears throat> under barter, we can imagine that goods have different degrees of saleability, how saleable they are. So the more saleable a good, the more easily the owner of that good can um, uh, exchange it for other goods at a price, right? A price that's denominated in terms of the good that I'm offering for sale. So something like bread that everybody wants, right? Except for, the, except for the Atkins people. We all want bread, right? So that's gonna be more saleable than say, if I've got my filter, I've got an extra filter for the hot tub and I'm going to the market to try to change that, exchange that, uh, the people with bread are gonna have an easier time finding an exchanging partner. Of course, it's not impossible for me to exchange my hot tub filter. I may have to accept a much lower price, right, as I'm uh, having difficulty changing. But a hot tub filter is clearly less saleable than bread. Um, <clears throat> owners of relatively less saleable goods like this hot tub filter uh, will exchange their goods for something um, that they don't want uh, they'll accept something they don't want as long as it's more saleable than the thing they gave up, right? And so um, <clears throat> as long as the goods received are more saleable, then I'm willing to um, get rid of my less saleable goods. So over time, Minger argued <clears throat> the most saleable goods were desired by more and more traders because of this advantage. And so then the demand for this most saleable good changes. So it's not only demanded for its uh, value and use, but also for its value in exchange. And when that happens, it becomes what we call a medium of exchange, right? So this choice of the good or goods as a medium of exchange is a gradual self-reinforcing process. We can imagine ourselves in this, trying to navigate through this, and we um, can imagine that we see, you know, bread or blueberries or whatever it is, if that becomes more and more acceptable, we, because it's being more and more accepted um, throughout the market, we are now more and more willing to accept it ourselves. And so this is a cycle that uh, is self-reinforcing. Um, we don't know how long this process would take for money to emerge out of barter, um, but we can think, you know, it might happen rather quickly uh, because people recognize the obvious benefits to themselves when they are trading in the market. So what are some characteristics that make, um, what are some characteristics that make uh, a commodity more likely to become a medium of exchange? Um, well, one is if it's easily, easily divisible. So not a hot tub, right? Not a hot tub, probably not even a bicycle. Right? These things are not easily divisible. Um, we want to be able to divide it up into smaller units without losing value. Um, also, if it's durable over long periods of time, this is going to be changing hands a lot. We don't want something that's going to be breaking down. So I mentioned blueberries, probably a bad choice. Right, blueberries would not be a good a good commodity um, to be money. Also, if easily transportable, if it's something super heavy, probably not the best. Uh, commodities to become the medium of exchange. Um, <clears throat> fungible, one unit of money is basically equivalent to any other uh, unit of money. And also scarce, right? If it's in limited supply, um, then that will make it more likely to become, to become the money. Eventually, one or two commodities are used as a generally accepted medium of exchange. 
and generally accepted really needs to be emphasized that most of us, all, most all of us, with very rare exceptions, it's being used. So in almost all exchanges, uh, if this medium of exchange is being used, then we can say, now it's money. Money is a generally accepted medium of exchange. So what are some things that have been money through the century? So the uh, we've had beads and wheat and shells and nails, and there's a story in POW camps where uh, cigarettes became, became money. It's an interesting uh, study for you to look at that. But through the centuries, uh, two commodities, gold and silver, and more often gold, has been uh, the chosen one that has displaced these others like gold, I mean, like uh, shells or beads or wheat. Um, <clears throat> that has been the chosen uh, commodity. So I got a question about what if, what if gold was falling from the sky and really sparkly asteroids? And I actually thought I was being punked when somebody asked me that question. Uh, but I thought about it, and um, uh, really, if something weird happened like that, some event where uh, we did, we have uh, gold falling from the sky, or we have there's some trick that we figure out. Probably there's YouTube videos already where we can make gold in our basement. Well, um, if that happens and gold becomes less scarce, uh, then would will we still have gold as money? Well, I mean, we might, or it might be the case that we could go through the same process again, right? And so um, uh, the market could choose some other commodity as money. Um, <clears throat> so Carl Minger pointed out that it's not necessarily even conceivable for money to be established by some authoritarian decree or by an explicit contract among the citizens where we all just get together and we just discuss it and we say, hey, 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 let's, the good idea, let's make this be our money, right? That's probably, Carl Minger said that's probably uh not likely, he called it inconceivable. Um, instead, the more plausible explanation is that money originated spontaneously because of the immediate and obvious benefit of using the more marketable good as a medium of exchange. And that immediate obvious benefit is recognized by the parties involved. So um, without actually experience it, it's experience it, experiencing it, say that five times fast, uh, it's hard to imagine somebody just coming up with this idea of money, right? So uh, Minger said, hence it is also clear that nothing may have been so favorable to the genesis of a medium of exchange as the acceptance on the part of the most discerning and capable economic subjects for their own economic gain and over a considerable period of time of eminently sellable goods in preference to all others. So money's unlikely to have originated in any other way because embedded in the demand for money is also this knowledge of what did this commodity trade for? What was the price of this yesterday when I was just trading it under barter? I know that, so now I kind of have an idea of what to I can expect in exchange for it today when it's now the generally accepted medium of exchange. So um, uh, Mises' regression theorem <clears throat> explains that it can only happen by beginning with a subjectively useful commodity under barter and then adding the demand for a medium of exchange to the previous demand for use under, um, under barter. So recently, and I say recently as a 57-year-old woman, recently can be last week or can be 18 years ago. But anyway, recently there's been an objection uh, to Minger's origin of money uh, story. And his book uh, came out in 2011, uh, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, anthropologist David Graeber. He claims that money does not have to uh, originate out of barter. He says, in fact, there's no evidence of the existence of any barter economy. I find this, frankly, frankly uh, unsurprising given the difficulties of barter that we just talked about um, <clears throat> and the advantages of a generally accepted medium of exchange. So I don't find that surprising, but this uh, idea that 
uh, money came about as a mean of sat- means of satisfying debts. Um, this idea was repeated also in an otherwise great book just two years ago came out. I don't know if you all have seen it, Edward Chancellor's uh, The Price of Time. But <clears throat> using the logic of action, Minger and Mises, they offered a plausible explanation of how commodity money must have emerged out of barter, even if we don't have, even if we don't have a historical record of it happening. <clears throat> Okay, so we talked about a commodity money coming out of barter, and we don't exactly have that now, right? How do we go from trading gold as a generally accepted medium of exchange to uh, paper money? <clears throat> well, um, paper, little rectangles of paper, right? Those don't have a lot of value in exchange. Um, if we go back to Um, when we were making this transition. People would not be willing to give up real goods, right, that they have have worked to come to own these goods. They wouldn't be willing to give those up for little rectangles of pieces of paper. Um, But gold is, you've probably noticed, gold's heavier than paper, right? And so people would put their gold in a secure warehouse and ask, somebody and pay somebody to store it in a secure warehouse. And when they put their gold there, they would get a receipt, a paper claim, to be able to come back and pick up that gold later. And to make purchases through time for convenience, right, what makes it easier for us, people started uh, paying with their paper claims. I can write on here, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm buying this and I'm buying this thing. So now I write on here, you know, pay to the order of, and this person now can go uh, use my paper claim. They can go to this gold warehouse and they can pick it up. And so um, <clears throat> we saw eventually the paper claims became also generally accepted as um, medium of exchange. So now that we have money, how much are we better off? How much are we better off now that we have money? Well, all the problems of barter are gone. Now we have a huge reduction in the number of prices, right? We Each good has one price, and it's all priced in terms of this generally accepted medium of exchange. Um, We've seen before that without money, there could be no real specialization in exchange. Um, Therefore, there could be no advancement of the economy above just a bare primitive level. Um, But with money, we can have an elaborate structure of production that can form um, with land, labor, services, and capital goods cooperating to advance at each stage of production and receiving payment in money. Okay, so only with the establishment of money can we have rational economic calculation. Now businessmen can determine, are we earning a profit or are we earning a loss? Because we can compare the values of everything in one, in one unit. They're all, the costs and the revenues are denominated in the same terms. Also with money, we can compare the market value of the market worth of each good compared to each uh, uh, any other good. Okay, so for example, uh, the dollar price, I just looked it up, is up close to $2,400 an ounce. Ounce of gold is now close to $2,400. Um, so if we, we can say a gaming computer costs around one ounce of gold, also around $2,400 around there, unless you get super fancy. Um, A new entry-level Ford Escape, which is about to be discontinued, but Ford Escape, 2024 uh, Ford Escape, you can get for um, around 12 ounces of gold. Last year, it was 20 ounces of gold. It's down because the price of gold has um, improved so much. So uh, we can see we can compare and we can say, well, one gaming computer is worth about, um, uh, or sorry, one escape is worth about 12 gaming computers. So um, <clears throat> what about the value of money? I said that gold is up to around $2,400 an ounce. How do we get that? Well, um, what exactly is the value of money? What is the price of money? I like to start with something else and we can see how that price is determined, then we can understand better 
um, uh, how it applies to money. So let's start with, say, my laptop. So if I take my laptop to the market to sell, how much money would it command in the market? Let's say if I could get um, $150 in the market for my laptop. Then we would say the purchasing power of my laptop is $150. That's what I can get in exchange for it in the market. So uh, purchasing power of my laptop is $150. So then we'd say that $1 buys a tiny piece, one 150th of my laptop, right? So it's the same thing with money. If I take this money, I wanna know what is the value of this money, what is the price of this money? If I sell my money, I'm going to the market like I will with my laptop, now I'm going with money, um, what can I get in exchange for it? Um, <clears throat> that is if I trade it for good. So uh, my laptop, I only traded it for money but my money can trade for everything else, right? And so to know the value of money, it's a whole array of prices. So um, <clears throat> if, uh, if it trades for, if, if it trades for one one fiftieth of a laptop, uh, if a steak dinner is forty dollars, I could get one fortieth for of a steak dinner for a um, uh, for a dollar. A dollar is also one thirty thousandth of a used car. So what is the purchasing power of money then? Well, it's really the whole array of quantities of other goods and services that it commands in exchange. So the purchasing power of the dollar, you can see from these examples, they are um, the inverse, the reciprocal of the overall price level of the um, <clears throat> the price level of what we can, I mean, uh, the prices in the economy. Uh, I want to say, by the way, the price level is really a personalized thing. It depends on uh, the basket of goods that you buy. Um, so we can be affected differently by the price of food rising, right, based on what we buy. But for gen in general, for our purposes here, let's think of just an overall level of prices. So what happens then if the price level doubles? What has happened then to the value of our money? The value of our money is then um, cut in half. So if the laptop is now instead of $150, now it's $300. Now a dollar doesn't buy one one fiftieth; it buys one three hundredth, right, of a laptop. So um, <clears throat> purchasing power of money can be thought of then as the price of money, where the price uh, of it is determined like the price of any other thing we get from supply and demand, interaction of buyers and sellers in the marketplace. And so if any good if you think about any good, and the value of money is determined the same way. If there's an increase in supply, then the value of an exchange falls. If there's a decrease in supply, the value of an exchange rises. Um, the converse with uh, demand for money, and remember demand for money uh, in our context here, that's how much money we wish to hold in cash balances because like Tate, we all were demanding, give me all the money I can get, right? But the amount that we hold in cash balances is our demand for money. When demand for money increases, uh, then it ex its value in exchange would also increase in the uh, opposite for when it decreases. So, um, I want to talk about what is the optimal supply of money. What is the optimal supply of money? We always hear about um, we always hear about the Federal Reserve increasing the money supply or tightening the money supply. Um, <clears throat> what should the money supply be? What is the optimal supply of money? Um, and does that optimal amount ever change based on what's happening in the economy, what's happening in the world? Now we need more, now we need less. Um, well, Rothbard pointed out, this is really a silly question. You don't see anybody asking, um, asking you know, uh, what is the optimal supply of tennis shoes? How many, uh, how many pizzas should we have? Right, what is the right amount? Do we allow that based on uh, that? We allow that to be determined just by the profitability of making tennis shoes, of making pizzas. So, um, <clears throat> an increase in consumer and producer goods like tennis shoes, like pizzas, those things are used up or they're worn out, right? And so, um, when we have more of them, we are better off because more of our wants are satisfied when we have more tennis shoes, we have more Air Jordans or whatever the things are now. Um, 
Money is different though, right? Money's different. As a medium of exchange, money is not used up and worn out. Um, <clears throat> Money instead is just transferred from one cash balance to another cash balance, right? It's not used up. It's not uh, losing its uh, ability to do the work. So um, that's why any money supply, any amount of money is just as good in any other when we, perf I mean, in performing this medium of exchange function. Purchasing power of money just adjusts it adjusts the price, the value of money in exchange adjusts to permit all the exchanges to occur that people want to make. Okay, so a money supply of $20 billion is able to finance the same number of transactions as a money supply of $200 billion. Okay, with the smaller money supply, the price level will just be lower. With the higher money supply, the price level will be higher, and we still have the same number of transactions facilitated by those. Okay, so we can, we can see the effects of an increase in the money supply with the Angel Gabriel model. In this model, we have a benevolent but economically ignorant uh, spirit that decides uh, he wants to benefit all of humankind by coming down to earth uh, one night and magically doubling everybody's cash balances while they're asleep. So we wake up uh, the next morning, and we discover that we all have double the cash balance we did when we went to sleep last night. And so we have excess cash balances now. We have extra money. And for some of us, what's it doing to our pockets? Burning a hole in our pocket, right? We gotta go spend that money. So some of us will rush out to spend the very first thing we get up at yesterday's price level. Right, so the, the early spenders go out and spend the money um, on consumer and, pro and producer goods. So the result is uh, when all of us are doing this, there's an increase in demand for all consumer and producer goods, and so the price of those all rise. Okay, so it turns out we're no better off, right? We're no better off. The number of consumer and producer goods has not changed. We just have higher prices for them because we had more money to spend on them. So um, uh, the, the resources have remained fixed. The technology hasn't changed. We just had more money to spend on them. And so no additional needs, no additional needs have been met. So even though the angel doubled the number of monetary units, the real money supply, which you get by dividing the money supply by the price level, um, that's been unchanged, right? And so the purchasing power of money has just been cut in half. But if you look a little bit more closely at what the angel did, we see that there are some people who were benefited. There are some people who gained the early birds, or as I call them the freaks, people get up early, um, why would you want to do that? Anyway, the people who get up early and they go spend their money really quick because um, they have no self-control. Anyway, those people, they get out and they spend the money at yesterday's price level. And so they are able to buy, uh, they are able to buy before the prices rise, okay? And so they gained in real income. And those who slept late, those who waited a few days, we were trying to be wise with this extra money, have some extra, exercise some prudence, right? Uh, we waited a few days or weeks before spending the new money. We lost out, though, because we made our purchases after the prices had risen and our cash balances had decreased so much in purchasing power. So the increase in money supply didn't benefit us as a whole, taken all together as uh, as a whole, but early early spenders are benefited at the um, expense of the late ones. So we can see that every money supply is just as optimal as any other. Um, a large money supply is no more beneficial to society than a smaller one. Um, <clears throat> I want us to look at the counterfeiting process, though. Um, under the gold standard, the one and only way to increase the money supply is to dig more gold out of the ground, right? Because we still don't know yet, I don't think, how to make gold in our basement, right? Do y'all know anything about that yet? If you do. Um, and we don't have gold, sparkly asteroids falling. Um, but 
Digging, my, digging gold out of the ground is a costly activity and it uses scarce resources. So the money supply is really under a gold standard, it's gonna be determined by the profitability of gold mining, okay? The profitability of mining, of course, is affected by the cost, right? Cost of mining gold, if those costs fall, the price level falls, then now it might be more profitable to go dig gold out of the ground. What happens though when we dig more gold out of the ground and we have uh, we have more money in circulation than what's gonna happen to the prices, those prices then, uh, price level would rise. And then if the costs of production um, increase, we have higher, if we have higher price level, then those costs of <clears throat> production would make gold mining less, uh, profitable. Um, so we should point out, though, that getting gold out of the ground, that is an increase in resources that would benefit society in some ways, because we can always use them in use, not just in exchange, right? So we can have more jewelry, we can use it in the production of uh, uh, electronics. But you can either get it by mining or you can get it fraudulently by counterfeiting it. Right, and so um, I want us to look at the effects of counterfeiting so we can better understand the inflation process. So let's say we've got some bad guys or girls, but I'm gonna call them bad guys, get together and they mint some counterfeit coins that they look like the real thing, but really they're made of brass. And they go out and they spend them um, and they go undetected as fakes. Okay, so they spend these fakes and that increases the money supply and it increases the demand uh, for goods and increasing the, the prices of those goods um, and decreasing then the purchasing power of money because of this increase in money supply. So just like the Angel Gabriel model, except for one crucial distinction, the new fake uh, money enters at a specific point. It is injected into the economy at a specific point, and then it spreads out as the fakes get spent and respent again um, uh, throughout the economy. The result is a demand for local goods bought by the bad guys. The demand for those goods increases first, and those prices also increases, increase first, and then it spreads until eventually all prices are uh, affected, but the counterfeiters, they have guaranteed that they will be the early spenders, right? They get to spend first, and then those that they buy from, they also are gonna be early spenders, and so those are, those are the ones who expense at the, I mean, sorry, who benefit at the expense of those who get it late in the process or not at all. Okay, think about the widows, the grandmothers on fixed incomes uh, who are not going to see an increase in their own personal income. Uh, they're gonna be worse off um, because they have the same income but a higher price level. So I appreciate this little sticker that was on our seats. Not taxation, which of course is still theft, but also this is a new twist. I like it. Inflation is theft, right? The counterfeiter. So counterfeiting is a subtle method of fraudulently gaining at the expense of the rest of us through the inflation process, right? This process of inflation is enriching them. So here's something I learned from Hoppe. I like to learn, I like to use this to close this lecture. Uh, I heard this and when he gave the money lecture, I'm sorry I'll have me instead of Hans. But Hoppe, this was in 1992, my first Mises U, he ended the lecture with this. He said, um, we would not expect money to be paper because like we said, paper does not have a lot of value in exchange. A little rectangle, rectangular piece of paper is not gonna have a lot of value in exchange. People are not gonna be giving me goods for that. Um, <clears throat> We would not expect it to be national because then when we are at the border, we're trying to trade internationally. I have to find somebody who wants dollars, right, who has the goods that I want um, and, uh, and vice versa for people um, trying to trade here in the United States. So we would not expect it because we have this double coincidence of wants requirement again. Um, and we would not expect it to be under the control of any entity because any supply of money, any amount of money is just as good as any other 
amount of money in uh, facilitating all the exchanges that we want to make. So why do we have a, pay, a money that is paper, national, and under control of a central bank? Well, turns out that, as we saw the counterfeiters, issuing currency transfers wealth to the issuer, right? And so a monopoly in the provision of money is the most desirable of all tools for the state to have. And so that's what we have today, money that is paper, national, and under the control of the central bank. So thank you very much. And place your